Finally, let me just talk briefly about national security with everything that's going on in Libya. I believe the most important thing we can do in the near future on national security is ask the House and Senate to hold thorough, deep reviews of where we are in the 10 years since 9-11. I do not believe that we are winning. I believe the world is more dangerous, our enemies are more sophisticated, and our systems are less capable. And I think it's very sobering. When, when the leading Pakistani governor who advocated tolerance is killed by his own security guard, and our intelligence was so inadequate we didn't even realize that the security guard was a jihadist, why would you trust the rest of our intelligence? The only Christian member of the Pakistani cabinet was killed in the last month. Four people who were helping the United States in Northwest Pakistan were killed in the last week. Pakistan is a very unstable country which may in fact be gradually moving away from us, which will be truly a catastrophe. Afghanistan, I think we're on a mission that is for all practical purposes impossible. It is inconceivable to me as a historian that you can take a tribal society deeply rooted in the 12th century and in a reasonable period of time move it into the 21st century. You are asking, and I think our troops can provide security. I think General Petraeus is, is a brilliant commander. But at the end of providing security, what you have is a country, one third of whose economy comes from selling drugs, deeply riddled by corruption, in which the local communities are tribal, and in which women are, ver are remarkably repressed. Now, for us to try to go in there and change that in the length of time Americans normally give to projects, I believe is utterly hopeless. And we had better design a new strategy. And the strategy had better recognize that fundamental change in some of these regions is going to take 50 to 70 years. And we had better invent a solution for that. And that, that solution can't be American troops on the ground for 50 or 70 years. That we will not sustain it. And furthermore, it's counterproductive. Because we end up being the occupiers, not the liberators. It's a very serious problem for us. And one we have to deal with intellectually. From 1947 to 1949, we wrestled with the problem of the Soviet Union. Kennan's long telegram taught us the nature of the Soviet system. In, in, in December of 1949, Harry Truman decided we had to build a hydrogen bomb, whose only purpose was destroying cities. And the Secretary of State said to him, we had better invent a strategy to not use it. And so they asked uh, Paul Nitze at the State Department Planning Board to invent the Cold War strategy. And on April 15, 1950, Harry Truman released NSC 68, National Security Council Memorandum 68, which really created what we did until 1991. And we systematically surrounded the Soviet Union diplomatically, militarily, economically, politically. We systematically tried to crowd them. But we also tried to avoid a world war. We sustained that as a people for 44 years. We sustained it while we grew richer, freer, more productive, technologically advanced, because we had designed a sustainable long strategy. We don't have today. We, look, this administration can't even tell you the truth about who's trying to kill us. I mean, they have, a, they have an army officer jump up in Fort Hood, yell Allahu Akbar, and shoot 33 Americans, wounding them and killing 13. And the administration can't even admit the person might have been motivated by religion. They have somebody in Germany who jumps up, yells Allahu Akbar, and kills two Americans. And the administration wonders why they were involved in terrorism. You have a suicide bomber from, he's not a suicide bomber, he's a, a car bomber from Pakistan who comes to the US gets citizenship, goes back home, leaves his family in Pakistan, takes a training course in a terrorist camp, comes back, creates a, a car bomb for Times Square, and the elites are so out of touch with reality and so desperate to avoid telling the truth that Mayor Bloomberg says on public television, you know, let's not rush to judgment. It could be somebody who was opposed to Obama's health plan. <laughs> now I want you to think about that. There have been thousands of jihadist suicide bombers. To the best of my knowledge, there have been zero health plan bombers. <laughs> so what does it tell you about how out of touch with reality the elites are, how frightened they are of the truth? Talk about two plus two equals 911. 
And so you can't design, imagine we'd had a strategic debate in the late 1940s in which you couldn't use the word communist, you couldn't use the word Soviet, you couldn't discuss the common turn, you couldn't explain the KGB. And you had to say, you know, on random days, Stalin seems a little strange. But I'm sure we can talk with him. We'd have lost all of our freedoms. So we need a fundamental rethinking. On Libya itself, presidents have to plan and execute professionally and then hold the press conference. When you hold the press conference before you plan, you get in real trouble. So on March 3rd, President Obama says, Gaddafi has to go. Well, have you noticed since then? The State Department reported to the Congress on the War Powers Act on a Friday and on Saturday said, we are not at war. The President said, Gaddafi has to go. The Chairman of the Joint Chiefs said, that's not our mission. The President said, it will be a very short mission. The Chairman of the Joint Chiefs said, I have no idea how long it will take. The White House, the State Department, and the Defense Department have four different versions of what we're doing. The Germans have pulled out. The French have agreed to lead it, but only if their mission is not our mission. The French want to kill tanks. And, I mean, this is a no-fly zone, right? All these liberal lawyers say we're going to have a no-fly zone. And they start killing tanks. Now, I know a fair amount about technology. I mean, how many Libyan flying tanks do you think there were? And, and, and don't misunderstand me. I am perfectly prepared for us to side with the Lib Libyan people against Gaddafi. I said in late February, we should help the Libyan people become free without using American military power by getting every possible ally in the Arab world, reinforcing the people who want to be free, and spreading the word through the Libyan military, you are going to lose. It's better for you to desert uh, Gaddafi and survive than it is for you to stick with him. Now, I think there were strategies that Eisenhower and Reagan would have approved of. They didn't involve publicly saying he has to leave and then doing nothing for two weeks. I mean, think, think about the sequence. Look at the, you, you have a spectator in chief instead of a commander in chief, and it is very dangerous for the security of the United States to have somebody who doesn't understand their job. on national security, something of direct relevance to North Carolina. This White House said last night they are not going to ask for a supplemental because they're going to take the Libyan campaign out of the current defense budget. We should not allow liberals to rip off the Pentagon budget for Obama's adventures. The fact is the military is overstretched. We are undercapitalized. We are not modernizing fast enough to keep up with China. Our infantry and our, our army and our Marines are overstretched in Afghanistan, the, the Horn of Africa and, and Iraq. And we have an obligation to say to the young men and women who put their lives at risk, when your president asks you to do something, we are going to fully fund it to ensure that we can sustain the defense United States. <laughs> Let me just close with this thought for all of you. And I say this from the depth of my being. I've been active since August of 1958. My dad was a career soldier in the infantry. And I've really tried to understand what America has to do to survive and be free and prosperous and safe. How to explain that to the American people so they'll give us permission to do it. And how to implement it so we can be effective. But in the end, we're in so much trouble in so many different ways that no politician can come here and tell you, you know, elect me and I'll fix it. We're going to need 311 million citizens who decide that their country's worth working, volunteering, helping, 
we're going to return power back home, and that means you're actually going to have a bigger burden of citizenship because you won't just be able to blame the bureaucrats. But you have a chance, I think unlike anybody since 1932, you're going to have a moment for the next year and a half when you can go to your neighbors, you can electronically go to your friends across the country, you can have a conversation about these two futures, American exceptionalism, European secular socialism. Jobs, competition, investment, productivity, bureaucracy, unemployment, food stamps, safety and profound professional methods that we know work, total opportunistic amateurism of enormous danger. And you're going to be able to say to folks, this is our best chance in a generation to put America back on the right track. And we need to do it at every level, from school board to city council to county commission to state legislature to governor to Congress to the presidency. With your help, there are enough people in this room who have enough Facebook friends and email friends and Twitter friends just in this room. You can help start a revolution that returns power to the American people and gives our children and grandchildren once again the greatest, freest, safest country in the history of the world. Thank you. Good luck and God bless you.